Okay, uh, so let's continue. Uh, so I will uh, try to give a summary actually of this uh, last part of the course uh, related to planetary ionospheres. Now, uh, I had quite maybe long introduction, but I will maybe skip some slides and anyways, it will be uploaded on the website uh, the presentation. So you will have it. You will have all these slides. So I mentioned in the morning that there is two interfaces with the solar wind. Uh, so the uh, magnetopause, an external uh, interface, and the internal one, internal one is the ionosphere. And actually, the ionosphere it can be uh, um, is one of is an example of a multi MHD approach. Actually, the solar wind we consider the plasma as one fluid, but the ionosphere is different. We we should for the uh, uh, MHD equation we should write them for each ion species uh, that we have. Also here, uh, we have an additional term really, which includes actually the ion uh, or the collisions between uh, the species that we are considering. Uh, and in the continuity equation, you would see here that we have two terms. The S are the source terms and the sources are related to, well, usually photoionization or the energetic particles and the loss terms they would be related to the chemical reactions or the recombination or a charge exchange, actually. So uh, uh, maybe very quickly, uh, some history about the ionosphere. So the ionosphere was discovered in 1901 by uh, also an Italian, Marconi, who actually was performing a, a first radio tr a signal transmission and uh, across uh, the Atlantic Ocean, actually. And he could uh, perform this uh, experiment successfully. So the ionosphere was kind of discovered accidentally, actually. And uh, many years later on, uh, 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 the success of his uh, experiment was interpreted by the presence. There should be a kind of conductive layer uh, in the atmosphere that is uh, making this experiment possible. And well, in 1926, uh, the word ionosphere was invented to uh, characterize this uh, layer in the atmosphere. Uh, okay, how do we measure, I mean, the, ion the ionosphere, or we knew the altitude of the ionosphere, this kind of plot is called ionogram. Uh, uh, and uh, basically by transmitting a wave, a kind of train of waves at different, uh, 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 let's say, well, frequency, because uh, they get reflected by the uh, ionosphere, we can kind of estimate the altitude of the ionosphere. And here, so the y-axis is the altitude as a function of the wave frequency. And you see, so this is the signature of the reflected waves from the ionosphere, and most of them are between 400 and let's say 600 kilometers. So that's the altitude of the ionosphere on Earth, actually. And you, would, you can see that above six megahertz, above this frequency, there's, there's no reflections of the waves. So the waves just propagates uh, uh, and go into space. And that's, uh, that's actually what we call the cutoff frequency uh, uh, of the wave. So all uh, the waves which are um, lower than this frequency will be reflected. And this phenomena, I mean, the reflection of the wave, we can, it happens from Earth, but also can happen from space. So there's lots of, uh, uh, in the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, for instance, the very uh, uh, large uh, wavelength uh, waves, they are also blocked by the atmosphere and reflected into uh, space. Uh, okay. So as you all know, the ionosphere plays a very important role in our uh, communications and the GPS signal. And also because it's, uh, um, it's made of charged particles, it's very sensitive to uh, any kind of uh, changing of the magnetic or electric conditions in space. Um, it doesn't want to move. Okay, so here just a profile actually 
so the altitude profile on both figures in the first one of the uh, uh, neutral gas, so of the atmosphere, and the second uh, plot is of the uh, plasma density. And here the red curve is the density of the neutrals and the blue curve is the temperature of the neutrals. And these different, uh, uh, well, um, at this different altitude, we have the different layers of the atmosphere, troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere. And these different layers are actually controlled by the changes of uh, uh, the temperature in the uh, atmosphere of Earth. However, this is the second plot here. It shows uh, uh, the profile of the ionosphere of Earth. And now the structure of the ionosphere of Earth is not uh, controlled by uh, the electron temperature, but more by the electron densities. And here you see the different, well, at least here we have three layers, region F, E, and D. The solid line is uh, the ionosphere uh, uh, during uh, daytime, and uh, the dashed lines is in during uh, in the night side. And you see, of course, as expected, because the ionosphere is formed mainly by photoionization due to the EUV uh, solar radiation, during the night time, the electron density is much higher than the night side. But then we still have a relatively important electron number densities in the night side, and that's because of the rotation of the Earth and also the transport of the plasma from the day side to the night side. Um, and so there are two basic requirements to form the ionosphere. Well, first, you need to have a neutral atmosphere. And the second requirement is the presence of a source of ionization of these gases. Uh, and this ionization can be due either by photoionization, so uh, from the photons, and or from energetic particles coming from the solar wind or from the magnetosphere itself. Uh, so this is just an example, actually, of an ionization by absorption of extreme EUV uh, light with, uh, so on uh, the atom here, uh, the oxygen, which would give positive ions plus uh, free uh, electrons. Yes. 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 It depends on the altitude, actually. Yes. yes. Yeah, but oxygen enters into the ionosphere, not from, uh, I mean, solar wind, etc. No, no. So no, it's. What is the mechanism? So, is so it's just the composition of the atmosphere of. Uh, so it's it's basically the atmosphere. I can show this plot. Is there some yes, as a, as a, as a, they are the dense. Gravity. Yeah. You see here, this is the profile of the density uh, of the neutral atmosphere. I mean, at this here, we don't show the composition, yeah. but the density is much higher at lower altitude than at higher altitude. Okay, because now, they have, because they have flow also, upper direction. Uh, I'm let me show yes molecular oxygen or is that the I mean atomic or is it gonna be ionized maybe because of photo ionic and this is yeah, yeah. lot of lot of water. So this is kind of, here I'm showing just the neutral density in Earth's uh, atmosphere. So uh, uh, so the, for at least for, so the dioxygen is, the density is really important. So let's say at this altitude, but then due to lots of photochemical, well, this photo dissociation and chemical reactions, then monoatomic oxygen can be as well uh, produced. And of course there are transport of, uh, 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 Yes, but uh, I mean, it's lots of processes that uh, take into account. Uh, 
Okay, so I talked about uh, photoionization. Uh, I can skip this. Uh, but now, uh, okay, so photoionization is a kind of a source of the forming the ionosphere. Now we have some other kind of reaction that from which we lose actually uh, these positively charged ions. And one of them is recombination and recombination always happens. And that's when, uh, so ions are lost by recombining. So, uh, 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 so they will just gain an electron and this will uh, produce an atom plus a release of energy. And an example of this is what we call air glow actually. And air, air glow is just the lights that we you observe, uh, which represents basically the ionosphere. And it shouldn't be confused actually with auroras, which is uh, uh, formed with a different kind of process. So air growth is very different from the northern lines or the auroras. And then you can have dissociative recombination when you have a splitting of a molecule uh, uh, into atoms in unexcited states. Uh, so why actually the profile of the ionosphere is, I mean, the shape is very particular, as I showed you, there is a peak in the ionosphere at a certain altitude. Why is it the case? So uh, actually, this is because uh, it's, and I will show it to you here, may, maybe more qualitatively, because, so it's like this, because it's the super superposition, actually, of uh, uh, the altitude dependence of the particle density and the flux intensity. Uh, so I showed you before, so the, actually the neutral particle uh, density and the profile decreases exponentially as a function of height, okay? Uh, and actually we can show uh, using like barometric row, low actually that uh, the, this is the expression of the uh, neutral uh, particle density, uh, uh, the profile and uh, uh, assuming an ideal gas and isothermal uh, temperature. And this uh, uh, density here is written as a function, well, uh, a certain N zero density at a certain uh, reference, let's say height. And then the, uh, big H here, I don't know if you're familiar, but it's the so-called scale height. Uh, and it's a function of the temperature, well, the mass, uh, 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 basically. And the scale height is basically, it reflects the vertical width of the atmosphere. Because how can you define what is the width of the atmosphere? So we use this quantity to uh, characterize uh, the different, let's say, widths or layers. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and surprisingly, it works really very well, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's better always to start very simple. And <laughs> they say that uh, when you go to up to a mountain, you go uphill. At some point, you feel something fresh yeah. on your heel, right? So yeah. It's basically, when you pass some uh, flags. Yes. The scale, scale, some portion of the scale, a, because when you go to a, in a your pressure so it's higher, like, yes. Yeah, because of the pressure. With the yes. Pressure. Yeah. Don't do it fast. No. <laughs> so this is how. So this is how the uh, den the density of the particles uh, varies as a function of the altitude due to gravity. Mainly, the density of the neutral, especially, is much higher at lower altitude than at higher altitude. Now, how would you think the flux intensity would vary? Would it uh, vary the same way or? So it will vary in the opposite way, actually. So the intensity of the solar radiation would decrease uh, 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 going down in altitude, okay? And you can see it directly here. So actually the combination of this density profile on the intensity of the solar flux is actually give the ionization kind of rate of the uh, ionosphere. So at high, very high altitude, the density, uh, the neutral uh, particle density is very low. But then even though the intensity of the solar radiation is very important, but we don't have much neutral to, to ionize. So, well, this is why the ionization rate is lower at higher altitude. On the other hand, at very low altitudes, 
Now, the density of uh, uh, the neutral particle is very high, but then the intensity of the solar radiation is very low. So that's why as well the ionization rates. So there is an optimum altitude where the ionization rate is maximum. And that's what uh, gives actually kind of this profile of uh, the ionosphere. Okay. Change it from the night side. Uh, the intent, the ionization rate, well, the intensity would change, yes. but then the profile would stay the same. But of course, the intensity would change. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. So because of, there is an inertia. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And the electron density will be maximum, I think, where these two curves cross each other. Yes, yeah. Uh, so this is uh, mainly, uh, so, and the solar flux is actually given by this formula here, which depends on the solar flux outside, so at infinity here, which is the solar flux outside the uh, atmosphere, and then it depends as well, of course, on the optical depth. Now, uh, I will uh, uh, skip some slides, but this was actually, uh, in the 1931, uh, Sidney Chapman actually who proposed a very simple uh, mathematical model to explain the formation of these ionized layers uh, uh, in the ionosphere. And of course, there are some assumptions I will skip. Okay, let's see. So, uh, so uh, if we consider only one type of gas, one, uh, well, and that the atmosphere is horizontally stratified. So we consider very simple geometric, uh, uh, geometrically uh, the problem. And then we also consider only monochromatic uh, radiation, so only one wavelength, and that the atmosphere is isothermal, so uh, that the scale height is constant as well. So basically, you can think that we are only considering one uh, layer in the uh, kind of the ionosphere. Well, uh, you can uh, actually show that the, uh, the ion production rate for a given zenith angle, so the zenith angle is the angle between the vertical direction with respect to the direction of the sun. So if the zenith angle is zero, this is, uh, uh, you, here you get the maximum actually uh, 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 ionization rate actually. Uh, and Z prime here is a kind of reduced uh, scale height. So is this, um, well, uh, yes, so it's, it's kind of the altitude with respect to a reference altitude. It's equal to the uh, maximum ion production rate, so at uh, the zenith angle equal to zero, and then uh, uh, time the, uh, so exponential these, uh, well, uh, variables. And the ratio of, uh, so this ion, the uh, ion production rate is, this formula is what is known the Chapman function. And so this is an example, actually. Here, the y-axis is the altitude. The x-axis is the ratio of the production rate uh, over, so the normalized one over the maximum ion production rate. And from this also, from this formula, you can get as well the ratio of the density over uh, N0 as well. So normalized kind of uh, electron number density is uh, produced. And you can fit, I mean, this uh, for a given zenith angle, you can get this kind of different profile of the ionosphere. So for the zenith angle equal to zero, here you get the maximum ionization rate at well uh, this altitude, but then uh, changing the zenith angle, uh, of course, it will be lower at 90 degrees. So, uh, okay, I can skip. I mean, one also important thing I wanted to talk about is uh, 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 the ionospheric currents. And that's very important because actually the ionosphere it's coupled to the whole magnetosphere by uh, uh, providing some, let's say, electrical um, conductivity channels. And this plays a very important role actually in space plasma since the ionosphere, it will connect uh, the different uh, uh, regions uh, electrically. And so this would uh, play a role in the energy transfer and the momentum from one region to another. So if we take the classical Ohm's law, so in the absence of a magnetic field, you have here uh, uh, the current is simply equal actually to uh, the conductivity of the plasma due to the collisions times the electric field. Now, if we add a magnetic field, 
as you know, so we obtained the generalized Ohm's law. And here the formula is a bit more, uh, uh, um, uh, more uh, 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 complex, let's say. So it is uh, related to the electric field, but then we have here the uh, uh, electron velocity uh, across B. So if we are parallel in the direction, parallel to the magnetic field, then this term goes to zero. And here we have what we call the parallel uh, conductivities or we obtain the field aligned currents. So the currents that are aligned with the magnetic field. But if we are perpendicular to the magnetic field, uh, it's not as, uh, as simple as the first one. Here we can get two types of conductivities. So in both cases, we are perpendicular to B. Now here the conductivity becomes a conductivity tensor actually. And uh, in the direction parallel to the electric field, we have what we call the Peterson currents. And in the direction perpendicular to E, we have what we call the hole currents. And here in this illustration, uh, so uh, uh, these are uh, illustration of the different conductivities or different currents. So we have the field aligned currents, the Peterson currents, and uh, the hole currents. And this will actually connect to the magnetosphere with the ionosphere. And it kind of will close the current system uh, in the magnetosphere. And what that current is also parallel to the magnetic current when uh, magnetic storm comes? Yes. It should be parallel to the magnetic current. Because it is also coupling between magnetosphere. Yes. Yeah. When magnetic storms come. Yeah, so that's how actually, uh, uh, so kind of this whole system is connected uh, with yeah, each other through. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so the ionospheres in our solar system. So actually all the planets except one, they have an um, ionosphere and except Mercury. Mercury has a very thin ionosphere. But we, so it's basically, uh, it, it doesn't really have an ionosphere. It has only an exosphere. So it's kind of the upper layer of the ionosphere. And also the moons around planets, they can have ionosphere. Uh, uh, also around comets, uh, they can have ionosphere. And the rings of Saturn as well, they have their own ionosphere actually due to the photoionization of the uh, charged uh, dusts and uh, the dust as well. So let's talk a little bit. Uh, how how long do I have? Uh... Okay. Yeah. 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 So yeah. So I will just give you an example of uh, the uh, how we can measure in situ actually, or we could measure in situ the ionosphere of Saturn. And I will focus actually in the final phase of the Cassini mission, which started between April twenty sixth until September twenty seventeen. And here on board, and for this, I will show you measurements from the Langley probe. So again, the Langley probe is this instrument, which is on board uh, the, the spacecraft. And during this final phase, actually, it was completely spectacular because for the first time, Cassini so, uh, uh, performed for 22 orbits and it crossed actually the gap between the planet and the main ring. And so for the, ah, this is maybe a video. So for the first time, we could actually sample in situ this region here between the rings of the planet and, um, and, uh, and Saturn. Um, and also we could measure uh, in situ for the first time, uh, 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 charge dust as well and, or, uh, uh, in this region. Okay, and then here you will see the different flybys or the different orbits uh, during this final phase of the mission. You can see it here. Ah, yes. So every week there was a one crossing of uh, this gap between the planets and uh, uh, the rings. Yes, every week. Uh, um yes yes every week we had one uh, flyby yeah but because this is the video like uh, <laughs> and so with the langley probe we could uh, uh take in situ measurement in this region here very close to the uh, planet 
uh, and the rings. And so we could measure uh, we could measure in situ the ionosphere of Saturn. So this is an illustration of the, all the orbits. The final orbit it actually crossed. Uh, it actually was just uh, uh, the end of the spacecraft mission. With and so it was just it it plunged into the atmosphere of the planet and then it just evaporated uh, in inside Saturn. You feel, you feel it. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so it was a control kind of crash of the instrument, actually, uh, of the spacecraft. And this is all uh, the 22 uh, orbits. And you see that this is, let's say, the closest approach. At the closest approach, the orbits, they cover different altitudes uh, 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 from, the, uh, uh, from Saturn. And this is, I mean, in this region here, the closest the innermost rings is, is called the D-ring. Okay. And the D-ring is very dusty ring, very thin, transparent ring. Now, I will show you a real image taken by Cassini, actually. This is a real image. And it's basically kind of the same of this one. And yeah. And this is, uh, this is the highest altitude of uh, the orbits when it, it crossed this region. This is the D-ring, and you see some of the orbits, they, ev they crossed even inside the D-ring. So with this measurement, we could also probe in situ the D-ring uh, region. And it was kind of risky because the, <laughs> the, the scientists, the engineers, I mean, they oriented the spacecraft in a way that the, uh, the high gain antenna was facing the the dust and all uh, facing the ring, so to protect the instrument, but it was very risky because they didn't know what to expect actually. And it went uh, uh, really uh, very well. So for the first time, we could also measure in situ the rings of Saturn's, uh, at least the innermost steering. And again, here I'm showing you the Langley probe instrument, uh, which was actually developed in the Institute of Space Physics in, in IRF in, in, in Uppsala, Sweden. Okay, so here I'm showing you uh, uh, one example. So of uh, the first, so this is the altitude profile of the electron number density for the first proximal orbit, uh, proximal orbit. So this panel is the electron number densities and this one is the electron temperature. And uh, let's say there's lots of information on this curve. Uh, the blue, I mean, all this part, of the plot is the inbound. And then uh, the, uh, so in the Northern hemisphere, and then the magenta line or the pink one is the uh, outbound portion of the orbit. So this one is in the Southern hemisphere. The blue, uh, uh, the dark blue curve here, it represents the electron number densities uh, uh, inferred from the Langmuir probe instrument. Uh, the red curve, is the ion number densities inferred from the Langley probe. And so we also uh, consider the ionosphere as a quasi-neutral medium. And this is, you can see it here, actually, the ion number density and the electron number density, they uh, are coincide very well. And then the black curve here is the electron number densities, but estimated from the upper hybrid frequency, uh, uh, the cutoff frequency of, of the upper hybrid waves, actually. And just to show you here an example, so this is a spectrogram of uh, an energy spectrogram, of, uh, uh, a frequency time uh, spectrogram actually of the wave uh, uh, during this uh, proximal orbit. And you can see very broad band emissions, but more importantly above the electron cyclotron frequency, you can see here a very narrow band kind of emission. And this emission was actually at the upper hybrid frequency and from this uh, basically uh, formula, we can estimate the electron number density. And this is the electron number densities inferred from this uh, upper hybrid uh, uh, frequency. And it it's uh, uh, very well, uh, consisting very well with the Langley probe measurements. I mean, the large scales, I mean, there's a small offsets here, but at least the very small scale variations, it's, uh, it's very well consistent. Now you see, this is the closest approach here at the lower altitude. And you see that the ionosphere of Saturn, at least uh, uh, below 4,000 kilometers, is about 
uh, the density is very high, about 10,000, uh, well, 1,000 for this case, particles per cc. And the temperature is very low, is about 0.1 EV. So it's a very dense and cold uh, ionosphere. Now you will also note a very clear asymmetry between the inbound and the outbound in the profile. And you see here a very sharp decrease actually in the electron number densities. Here, well, but here there was a data gap, but it's consistent for the other flyby. And, and a local increase in this region. And that was, this is really very nice because this actually related directly to the ring shadows so the A and the B ring are opaque to the EUB solar radiation. I can show you. Uh, yes. So this is Saturn, again, of one of the orbits of Cassini. And on the color here, it shows the, the electron number densities. And these are the rings. The first rings, the D and the C rings are very transparent to the EUV solar radiation. But this is not the case to the B and the A ring. They are very opaque to the UV solar radiation. And so below in the Southern hemisphere, there was a shadow actually because of these rings. And so of course, in these shadowed regions, there is much less ionization. And so we have much less electron number densities. So it was very, and in between these rings, you see here, there's a, a kind of a gap it was discovered by Cassini, so uh, the scientist. So, uh, so that's why it is named the Cassini division. And it's transparent to the UV solar radiation. And that's why we observe kind of a local ionization in this region. So it was very nice that with the Langley probe, we could actually observe uh, this, uh, uh, the presence of this A and the B ring shadows. And also we could study the effect of this A and the B ring shadows on uh, kind of the transport in the ionosphere of Saturn. Uh, okay, I think I will just, I will show this and then I, I can stop. So here I showed you only one example of the ionosphere of Saturn. But of course uh, we want to try to construct a standard ionospheric profile for uh, Saturn. And so we combined all the proximal orbits. So these are all the orbits of Cassini around Saturn. The y-axis is the altitude as a function of the latitude here. And the color bar represents the electron number density. The crosses here represents the closest approach of Cassini to, uh, to Saturn. And it's in the Southern hemisphere basically is a minus uh, five degrees. And also uh, here, you can see it very clearly uh, the clear asymmetry between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And this is, as I said, due to the ring shadowing effects. So uh, if we want to construct the kind of ionospheric model for Saturn's ionosphere, we need to exclude these effects of the ring shadow. So we just focus on analyzing all the electron number density profile in this box here. So basically, around equatorial uh, latitude between minus 15 and 15 uh, degrees. And so we, uh, uh, so we can compare this electron number densities profile uh, between the Northern hemisphere and the Southern hemisphere. So uh, this, uh, again, the Y axis is the altitude as a function of the electron number density, the color, uh, okay, let's forget about the color bar so far. Uh, in the Northern Hemisphere and then in the Southern Hemisphere. If we look at the Northern Hemisphere, you can see well that the electron number density uh, uh, increases, increases at, uh, as, as we go uh, 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 down in altitude. And you can see that the density goes up to about more than 10,000 particles per cc at the closest approach. So it's very high, very dense ionosphere actually. And also you can note that in the Northern hemisphere, the, the profile are, are kind of organized. So above 4,000 kilometers, except this orbit here, but I will tell you why. The profile, I mean, the variation is kind of constant uh, with the altitude. Then between let's say uh, 2,500 uh, alti uh, kilometers up to about uh, 4,000 kilometers here, the profile look like uh, uh, variable and uh, more kind of uh, structured. 
And then below 2000 kilometers, the profile becomes smooth again. So as if we have kind of different uh, layers here in the Northern hemisphere. Now, if we compare to the Southern hemisphere, this is not the case actually at all these altitude uh, uh, kind of region, the, the profiles look like very structured and variable and not at all organized as is in the Northern hemisphere. So why is it the case? To understand the difference between this Northern and Southern hemisphere profile, we looked at the, what is called the magnetic L shell values. The magnetic L shell value is the distance on, uh, so the equatorial plane uh, where uh, the magnetic field so crosses the equatorial plane, okay? So if an L, so a very particular L shell value here is about 1.11. And that's where uh, the D ring uh, starts actually, okay? Uh, so all the color, colors, uh, so uh, yellow or red represents actually basically the crossing of the D ring by the magnetic field. So when we uh, add this information to this profile, you see that, well, in the Northern hemisphere, here, the ionosphere, so uh, this yellow color is only above 6,000 kilometers, which means that in the Northern hem uh, hemisphere, above 6,000 kilometers, the uh, magnetic field is actually, uh, 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 or the ionosphere is coupled to the magnetic field that crosses the D-ring. But in the Southern hemisphere, uh, this actually happens at all these different altitudes. So this actually shows indirectly the role of the uh, uh, magnetic field in kind of shuffling uh, or the structure of the ionosphere, but also it, 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 it implies the important role of the uh, magnetic field in uh, facilitating the coupling actually between the rings and the ionosphere of uh, Saturn. And we have this clear asymmetry between both, basically because the, uh, uh, the whole magnetic field, the dipole magnetic field of Saturn is shifted towards the north. So we have also an asymmetry in the kind of the uh, uh, structure of the uh, mag magnetic field. So uh, do you have current along the, the rings as well? Yes. And that distorts the dipole. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, I, and I mentioned this prof, uh, this particular pr profile here. Why this is the electron number density? Why for this one is much lower than the other ones? Actually, this this profile is one of the cases where uh, the uh, uh, Cassini was very close to the Deering, and so. When we look at the uh, Langley probe data, we could see that for this case, actually uh, the electron number density was very uh, uh, low because uh, um, the Langley probe could indirectly uh, uh, measure the presence of negatively charged dust. That's why the electron number density was lower. So this is basically uh, the Langley probe observations. The y-axis is the bias voltage as a function of time. And then uh, the current is shown in the color bar here. Um, so when we uh, compute, uh, it's not very clear here. Uh, so when we compute the different number densities, so the red one is uh, the ion number densities, okay? The red curve. And this is the closest approach in this region. And uh, uh, let me check because I forgot. Uh, and uh, the electron number density, let's look only at the red curve and the blue curve. The electron number density is given by the blue curve and the ion number density is given by this red curve. And you see the ion number density is not equal to the electron number density. And we know that the plasma is quasi neutral in uh, the ionosphere. It should be quasi neutral. So this means that we have additionally negatively charged dust that uh, corrects for this quasi neutrality. And that's how indirectly we could measure the presence of the negatively charged dust. So um, then of course, uh, so we took all, so uh, the profile in the Northern hemisphere, because here we don't have any effect from uh, the rings of Saturn. And we can kind of, 
co uh, construct uh, uh, average ionosphere or standard ionospheric profile of Saturn. And based on this, only this observation, we can uh, kind of categorize the ionosphere of Saturn in three different layers. So above 4,000 kilometers, the, the profile look kind of constant between 2,500 2, kilometers and up to 4,000 kilometers. Uh, the density kind of increases exponentially. And then below 2,500 kilometers, the profile becomes smooth again. And we compared this average profile to uh, the profile of the final plunge of uh, uh, Cassini that actually covered continuously all these altitude ranges. And you see that it's quite comparable, actually, the profile, where above 4,000 kilometers is quite constant. In this, in this layer, we have lots of variations. And then below, the profile becomes smooth again. And then for these different layers, we can fit this uh, kind of layers and we can estimate the scale heights as well in these different layers in the ionosphere of Saturn. Uh, uh, now, uh, I forgot to mention, okay, let me. So in this below 2000 kilometers, uh, here the, uh, the uh, let's say, um, uh, we will have well chemical equilibrium processes will dominate because we are we are at very low uh, altitude and in this uh, 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 range we would have the diffusion kind of equilibrium processes that would dominate maybe uh, these variations could be due to other kind of waves other kind of transport processes, but it's very difficult to say with this data. And then above 4,000 kilometers at very high altitude, the ionosphere starts to connect with the plasma sphere. And one last thing maybe I wanted to show, yes, um, that uh, also, I mean, we could detect, you see here, there is one peak, this uh, uh, at very low altitude at 200 kilometers uh, from Saturn. But uh, this it doesn't mean that this is the main peak of the ionosphere. It could be one of the peaks of the ionosphere. And that's it. I think um, I'm done. Thank you. I, I wanted to call, talk about the ring shadowing effects, but I think uh, I can stop here and... Uh, but uh, it will be in the presentation. And I think you must be very tired. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I'm thirsty, actually. So I'll just drink water. Yeah, yeah, I will. So, Thank Questions for you? No, I think it's just maybe the order in which they discovered them. I think uh, maybe A was discovered uh, in the beginning. Uh, a, B, C, D. There's the F ring, the E ring, and I miss one. But I, there's, I think it's just the order. Uh, no. Yeah. And no, the, no originality. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, yes, we do have. But uh, I didn't show it here because we have. No next. No next. <laughs> but uh, maybe I can add some references. I mean, I, there are already some references, but of course, here I only talked about the Langley probe. Well, maybe I could have talked about other instruments as well. But we, there was also a magnetometer on board uh, the spacecraft, and uh, we could measure in detail as well uh, the magnetic field, the internal magnetic field of Saturn. Ah. Uh, I forgot the value, but it's a very strong magnetic field, actually. But uh, yeah, yes, yes, it's much stronger than Earth. What I only remember is that you know the uh, um, the inclination of uh, Saturn's uh, 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 rotation axis is actually very well aligned with the axis of the magnetic field. And uh, there is no inclination actually. 
and they could uh, uh, calculate the angle, which was 0, 0.00 something, so extremely low. So it was perfectly aligned, actually, with the... Yeah. Yes. So the elect so I show the electron current actually increases uh, uh, exponentially with uh, uh, exponentially and then at some point uh, it saturates once the uh, potential of that we apply it balances the potential of the plasma that's I think it is because of the high mobility of the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. The current density is a product of charge. And the density is the, the velocity. The density might be comparable, but the, the, yes. one more mobile because it's lighter than the other. Okay, yeah. so if we apply a high voltage, if we apply the high voltage, should we get the same trend as for electrons? No, no. the voltage, the voltage no. is determined by the floating potential and the plasma potential. We have to first uh, get an approximate yes. of the plasma, like what is the voltage potential, and then on the basis of that, we determine the range in which we want to take the to get the characteristics. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I'm sure that she's more expert than me on language of experiment. <laughs> yes. Yes. For this one, yes. I think, well, for this case, we are really measuring nanometer sized okay, so grace. So, extremely uh, small, and the speed of the spacecraft was very high. I forgot how much. So, this. Uh, well, um, at the closest approach, yes, they dominate, but not uh, in all over the space. So, let's have one last question here. Yeah. Thank you. Question, just a question uh, about your uh, future problem. If you could share with us your future problem, ah, so only the direct information can help to understand things, also problems and thinking, giving something for us by that in PDF. So, uh, it's okay. <laughs> I have lots of future projects, but I can tell you, at least for now what I'm. I mean, my background was really solar wind turbulence. That's what I did in my PhD, but then in my postdoc, and so far I'm doing much more planetary kind of, or magnetospheric uh, uh, um, related uh, kind of processes. Yeah, and, and, and now I'm actually mostly involved in the mass spectrum analyzer instrument that I present you. So, I'm kind of doing instrumental uh, calibration as well for the Bepi Colombo mission. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. you're welcome. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yes, we have like 15, 20 minutes. 20 minutes for more. This is an hour. Okay, okay. <laughs>
That's a challenge. So they can do this on different levels. Like the easy one, rock and roll, heavy rock. metal, or jazz. Jazz will not be easy. It will be easy. It will be easy for us to get. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. When you need it, the Protector or no, 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 no. Uh, stop. Ah. You like all the school. Start. 